Hi, my name's Laura McDonald. I work in the education team here at Robert Burns Birthplace Museum and I'm going to talk to you about Scottish history in this video. In this video we're going to talk about how to understand Scottish history. We're going to start way back in the mists of time with the indigenous uh, peoples of Scotland who were known as the Picts and we're going to take that right up to the 13th century when the area that we now call Scotland became a recognisable nation. The earliest documented inhabitants of this area that we now call Scotland were known as the Picts. That was the name that the Roman gave to them, the, the Picti, which is a collective name for all the different Pictish tribes. The largest tribe were known as the Caledonii, uh, which is where the ancient name for Scotland comes from, Caledonia. The Romans invaded Scotland in around about the year 80 AD, but they didn't actually get very far. They only got as far as uh, the, the central belt, the line between the River Forth and the River Clyde, and the Picts always managed to beat them back. So. The, uh, the Romans never got any farther than that. They built a wall called the Antonine Wall between the Forth and the Clyde um, as a defence against the Picts, but they only actually managed to defend it for 20 years before being pushed back to Hadrian's Wall in the north of England. After the Roman withdrawal in the year 410 AD, they left a massive power vacuum. Uh, they had the Picts in the north and the native Britons and Romano-Britons uh, in the south of the country. Um, and an awful lot of different peoples tried to fill up that power vacuum. We had the Angles of Anglo-Saxon fame who invaded from Central Europe and occupied areas in the south east of the country and all the way down into what we now think of as England. Um, we also had a band of Gales, what we now call Gales, they were known as the Scottie, which is where the name Scott comes from. They invaded from Northern Ireland. There's only actually 12 miles of water between the tip of Argyll and the north of Ireland in Antrim and there was an awful lot of trade going on between those two peoples anyway. Another group invaded from the west, uh, from Ireland. They were called the Gaels or the Scottie in Latin and they set up a kingdom um, in the west called Dalriada um, which set up um, its lands in Argyll and Butte and those areas in the, the far west of Scotland. Over the next few centuries, the Gaels expanded the territory from the far west across northern mainland Scotland into what had been Pictish territory. So that by the 9th century, most of the north of Scotland was Gaelic speaking. In the 9th century, Scotland was invaded again, this time from the north by Vikings. Vikings took ownership of all the islands around Scotland, from the Shetlands and Orkneys, um, in the north all the way through the Outer Hebrides down the west side of Scotland all the way down to the Isle of Man and they also set up trading points between Ireland and Norway at all those islands in between. The next incursion into what we now think of as Scottish territory came after 1066 when Norman French barons took large tracts of land in the border region of southern Scotland. So up until the 13th century those that had called themselves the kings of Scots were only actually kings of a very small area, the south east and central Scotland. Um, the islands, the Orkneys, the Hebrides were all loyal to Norway. The areas in the far north such as Sutherland and Caithness and in the far west like Argyll and Galloway were really only loyal unto themselves. Um, they certainly didn't have any loyalty to what was called the Scottish Crown. But one man changed that. Alexander II was crowned in the year 1214 and he was known as the Hammer of the Scots. He also managed to establish an official border between Scotland and England for the first time and it's almost uh, the same one that we would recognise today. By the end of Alexander II's reign, Scotland was an independent, recognised and united nation. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. Um, Scotland enjoyed quite cordial relations with England uh, after the next king, Alexander III, married the, queen, the King of England's daughter, Margaret. But unfortunately, um, the good luck was not to last. Alexander III died in a freak accident and left no male heir. His closest uh, relative was his three-year-old granddaughter who had been born in Norway and sadly little Margaret died on the crossing from Norway to Scotland to retake her crown so this left Scotland with no royal rulers. There were two noblemen in Scotland who 
claimed the throne. They were called John Balliol and Robert the Bruce. It was, it proved very difficult to decide which of these two men should take the crown. So they decided to call a meeting with Edward I, King of England, and asked him, him to judge both arguments and to decide on a king himself. Edward played this very, very well, and he got all of the people at the meeting to swear loyalty to him before he would decide on a king for Scotland. This meant that when John Balliol, as it was, was eventually crowned king of Scotland, he was always in the thrall of the English king, and the English king took as many opportunities as he could to humiliate and embarrass him. Scotland also found itself in between a rock and a hard place because they had sworn ties of loyalty both to England and to France. So when England went to war with France, Scotland had to choose. They came down on the side of the French and invaded England from the north, while the English troops were over in France in Gascony. Edward I took his revenge on the Scots by imprisoning Balliol, stripping him of the crown and murdering most of his closest supporters. He then went on a tour of Scotland, visiting every borough and collecting seals of loyalty from every landowner in the country. There was one very significant name missing from this document. It became known as the Ragman's Roll. That name was William Wallace. William Wallace was a rather minor nobleman from an area called Eldersley, not far from Renfrew in modern Scotland. And although he was a minor nobleman, he wasn't so minor to have been left off the list, so we think this is quite possibly an act of rebellion. Wallace gathered together a ragtag army of Scots and using guerrilla and tactics and surprise tactics launched attacks on the English occupying forces around Scotland. Wallace won an astonishing battle at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297 and was given the title of the Guardian of Scotland. This was stripped from him after the loss at the Battle of Falkirk the following year. And after that, Wallace had to go into hiding and he managed to escape the English forces until the year 1305 when he was captured, sent to London, and he was tried, hung, drawn, and quartered in the August of 1305. The efforts and the victories brought about by William Wallace inspired others, most notably Robert the Bruce, who was crowned King of Scots in 1306. Now this was not technically possible. King Edward had also taken the crown jewels, the Holy Rood of St Margaret and the Stone of Destiny, all of the artefacts needed to crown a Scottish king. Bruce battled uh, for many years against English troops. His most notable victory was of course the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, where he defeated uh, Edward II. The year 1320 was a very important one in the fight for Scottish independence. It's the year that Scottish nobles and bishops wrote letters to the Pope affirming Scotland's place as an independent nation. This document that survives is called the Declaration of Our Broth and it tells the story, mostly mythologised, of Scotland from the earliest times as an independent country, not a subsidiary district of England. So those are some of the key points of Scottish history that helped shape the nation as it is today.